Welcome to Building the Future, hosted by Kevin Horick. With millions of listeners a month, Building the Future has quickly become one of the fastest rising programs with a focus on interviewing startups, entrepreneurs, investors, CEOs, and more. The radio and TV show airs in 15 markets across the globe, including Silicon Valley. For full show times, past episodes, or to sponsor the show, please visit buildingthefutureshow.com. Welcome back to the show. Today we have Sarah Kaus. She's an advisor, investor, advocate, and founder, and she was the former CEO of Swell. Sarah, welcome to the show. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on the show. I, I think, well, let's be honest, Swell is a huge brand that's been around a long time, and I think everybody's probably heard of it at this point and probably owns a bunch of uh, the product, myself included, I, I was saying earlier, I was like, went into the pantry. I was like, oh, yeah, we got like four, five, six of these things. So, I, you know, I've been using your product for a number of years and, uh, you know, love it. So, so before we maybe get into Swell and what you're doing today, because I think that's, you know, really exciting as well. Maybe let's get to know you a little bit better and start off with where you grew up. Sure. I grew up in a small town in Florida called Jupiter. It's okay, on the very East cool. Coast, and um, we, uh, I have a, sm a small family, mom and dad, uh, one brother who's really close to my age, and um, I think we grew up in a very like sort of simple, happy place. Okay, interesting. So walk us through. You went to university. What did you take, and why? Um, so I went to the University of Colorado in Boulder. Okay. And I wound up with a degree in accounting uh, because okay. the accountants were getting really good jobs and I had some college debt that I needed to work off um, coming from out of state and all. But um, while I was in Boulder, all of my science classes were earth science classes and the labs were actually hiking up in the mountains. So I spent a fair amount of time out in nature in Colorado while I was in school. Um, all the while using a reusable water bottle. So, you know, I probably uh, had some early ideas for Swell while I was hiking around as an undergrad in Colorado, but just didn't know it at the time. Okay, interesting. So what made you go so far west? Because arguably, Florida's very nice, especially the area you're, you're in. I've actually been to where you're from before, and it's very nice. It's very nice. Well, I think... I had Wonderlust as a child, so I was a okay. scout growing up, and I was lucky enough to go away to some sleepaway camps, and one of the camps I went to was in the West, and I fell ah, in love with the mountains. I think part it. of it was, I, being from a small town, I went to Jupiter Elementary, Jupiter Middle, and Jupiter High, and it was the same kids. Got and it, yeah. I love those kids, but I thought if I'm going to go off to college, I should probably go off to college, so I convinced my folks to let me go to Boulder. Okay. No, very cool. I live close to the Rocky Mountains, so I get it. They're beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so I'm curious, walk us through your career, getting your MBA and then coming up with the idea for Swell. And then let's dive into that and then kind of what you're doing today. Sure. So I would say I took a lot of um, sharp right hand turns in my career. Um, I, I graduated, as you mentioned, with an accounting degree. I got my CPA and I worked at Ernst & Young in Denver for a few years in the audit department. Uh, from there, I stayed with EY, and I went to Los Angeles. It was sort of dot-com one, and I did um, the taxes for entrepreneurs that were starting a lot of the internet companies in 99, 2000, 2001. It was a really fun time. It was you know, pre-Sarbanes-Oxley, so the company that I was working with, you, I was working with the individuals, with the, with the people starting the company at the same time that EY was working with the companies mostly to take them public on some exchange. And it's really where I met a, a fair number of pretty young, but pretty inspirational entrepreneurs, young and young enough in my career that I, I didn't want to be doing their books for the rest of my life and their taxes. I really wanted to jump to the other side of the table and become them. Um, so one of the entrepreneurs that I was working with, um, an internet entrepreneur, sat me down and said, you know, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And he had gone to get his MBA and said, you know, maybe maybe you should consider an MBA almost as a business finishing school where you give yourself the luxury of time to think about, you know, what you might start and what you might do. And I was lucky enough to get into Harvard Business School. And in 2001, right as the market was crashing for, for a lot of dot-com one, um, I went off to HBS. Interesting. Okay. So I, I know you've told this story a million times, but how did you come up with the idea swell and for people that maybe that haven't don't know what 
what exactly is it and what has it become? Because it's, you know, obviously a very well-known brand now, but you've been at it a long time. So it's obviously evolved over time. That's true. So I had the idea for Swell to create a, a water bottle, just a single water bottle, something that looked better and worked harder that would have a positive impact on the planet. So sure. uh, as I mentioned, you know, I was always hiking around when I was an undergrad with a reusable water bottle. It was um, sustainable, but it wasn't necessarily fashionable and it wasn't insulated. So it didn't keep things hot and cold for a really long time. You know, hiking on a hot summer day wasn't necessarily a refreshing sip of water. And so I had this aha moment while I was hiking once in, in Arizona with my mom. I had this idea to create a better water bottle, but, but really start from the beginning with a company on a mission to tell a story. So I, I really wanted people to have a, a beautifully, your designer, a beautifully designed product that they would yeah. they would covet and they would use because they felt differently about it. There are, there are plenty of water bottles out there when sure. I started Swell, but they were sold in hiking and camping stores. They weren't something that you would you would express your personal identity or style with. I wanted something that you would, you know, if you were a fashionista, like, you know, I like to think that I was at the time, you know, would you be buying it in a beautiful department store or yeah, was it enough. designed in a way that it, you could, you could hold it up equal with your Apple iPhone or, so I, I really wanted it to be functional, but, but, but covetable, beautiful at the same time. And from that very first swell bottle that I ever sold, um, I was on a mission to not just tell the story about sustainability and trying to get people to use less single-use plastic and plastic, you know, water bottles. But I partnered with water um, ch with charities that were bringing clean drinking water and sanitation in developing countries that didn't have access to drinking water. So I was on a mission to tell a story that you can drink the tap water here. It's really good. And by the way, by making this one sustainable choice, we can all together provide clean drinking water to those in need. Now that was a lot packaged in one story for sure. one little one little product. But it was literally that day on a hike, Kevin, that it all sort of came together in my mind that I thought, I think that there's a there there and there's a space to create a better product with a mission attached to it. Sure. It's interesting because... You started this uh, like 13 years ago, correct? That's Around right. there? Right. So like now what you just outlined is, well, of course we're going to do like that. We're going to, you know, partner with charities. We're going to try to do all these things and we're going to have this product. But like back then, nobody was doing that or very, very few people were doing that. Is it fair to say? I think that's fair to say, Kevin. I, I would like to think that Swell hopefully inspired a number of companies to infuse mission and purpose in, in sure. what they're doing sooner than they might have otherwise. Sure. Well, and I also think you've inspired other, probably even water companies, because there's water companies now that just put their water in cans now. They obviously put them in like almost like juice box type cartons. Like, That's right. You know, that came after what you were doing, right? So I think you inspired a whole movement around a lot of that, right? I Not just competitors. I think that's true. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I would say that's true. Um, so I, I'm curious, maybe give us like a quick history of Swell and then let's get into what Swell's up to today and what you're up to today. Because I, I think that's just as cool. Oh, Kevin, you froze. Oh. Uh oh. Can you can you hear me now? Now I can okay. hear you, yeah. Okay. Did you hear me a question or? Um, I think you said give a quick history of Swell and then tell and tell me what Swell's up to now or? Yeah. I'd be, yeah. Basically, can you give me like a quick history of Swell, what it's doing now, up to now, and then I want to dive into what you're doing because I think that's just as interesting and cool. Oh, thanks. Uh, so brief history of Swell. As you mentioned, I started the company 13 years ago. I started the company... Uh, very humbly with my myself as the sole uh, employee and sole entrepreneur, sole founder. Um, I never raised uh, capital. So because of that, I didn't necessarily put together um, an advisory board or a formal board. Um, fast forward, you know, a few years, I added a few additional colors to that original swell bottle shape. Um, started adding some some larger sizes, uh, a bigger size that holds a whole bottle of wine for picnics or a lot of water for a soccer practice, um, a smaller one for maybe hot coffee or tea or you know fitting in a small handbag. Um, fast forward a few more years, we got into food containers and lunch boxes and ice cream containers and a whole proliferation of other 
products that, you know, very well designed, you know, designed to make you happy, but always thinking about how do you reduce single use plastic and waste overall. Um, and then fast forward to last year, I actually sold the company. Um, Congrats. That's huge. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it wasn't something that I ever really thought about. You know, it was always, uh, I was loved Swell. I uh, loved Swell like my first child, you know, it was sure. something that I, I enjoyed. I enjoyed the team. I enjoyed the building. I enjoyed the culture. Um, but at the same time, I, I never really thought about, you know, what did it look like? You know, where does Swell go when it goes off to college? You know, what happened to the company when it grows up and, and leaves the nest? And um, I found a really good partner for Swell last year and made the decision to, uh, to move on. So Swell is in good hands. Um, I, I still follow the brand on Instagram, and I'm always happy to see what's happening and the new, the new colorways and patterns that are coming out. Uh, there's a fair number of old Swelly um, employees that are, are still uh, working, toiling away and, and you know, keep bringing the company and the, the brand into the future. Um, but officially, uh, I am a free agent and I'm off doing other things now. Okay, very cool. Yeah. So hopefully you took some time off, but what are you doing now? Because it sounds like you're doing some really interesting stuff. So funny enough, Kevin, I didn't take any time off. No, okay. I think that would be the advice to any <laughs> company is don't say yes to anything for yeah. a number of yeah. months. I, I don't know what, what happened, but um, I think for so long, I was really just focused on Swell that I sure. said no to almost everything else. Okay. And I was starting to get a bunch of uh, inbound requests and I had some some ideas of some things that I wanted to do. And I, I, I think I overfilled my dance card a bit in the last year. Um, so <laughs> no, no rest for the weary, but, um, but it's, it, it's actually been a really good year. So I've done some investing. Um, I've done some board work. I'm doing some advisory. I would say sustainability is really my North star. Okay. Um, but I, I have gotten involved in some things that aren't classically involved in sustainability because I, I find that I really fall in love with founders and, I probably was the poster child for what not to do in entrepreneurship. I made a lot of mistakes. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't necessarily have the help that I needed at every stage. Okay. And, you know, because I did swell for so long, I learned a lot. And so when I meet founders that I realize um, that either they're, they're struggling or they're, they're honest enough to ask for a little bit of help, I always make room and time in my calendar to say, okay, you know, what is it that you've got going on? What can I help you with? And so I have, uh, I have a fair number of individuals that I'm not an official board member, but I'm an advisor and I really enjoy it because I know I can, I can help set them on their way. Okay. So obviously you're probably getting pitched all the time for investment to be an advisor, maybe a board member, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How do you filter that out and, and what exactly are you looking for? Because you said like in a person, but what are you looking for to actually help and get involved? Well, some of it is scalability. Um, okay. For, for me, and it, part of it probably is coming, you know, coming because I started my career in accounting. Um, mm, and interesting. I look for a good, solid, profitable, scalable business. And right if you're going to have impact, you're going to have to have some profitability, at least at some point to be yeah. able to plow it back into your employees and back into, you know, the impact and, and the, the, the mission of what you're doing. And so, you know, at, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I do get pitched a lot, but I'm, I'm generally flipping the deck to the back and looking at the numbers first and really trying to understand what is the business model? What are the margins? You know, what are the gross margins? What's happening here? You know, how does this get big? How does this win? And then thinking about how, how, how do you use that then for impact? How do you use that then for whatever the, the purpose is of, of the company that, you know, this individual or this team is, is trying to bring to the world? Okay. So when you say sustainability, what does that really mean to you? Because obviously in the Swell's case, it was really easy to tie clean drinking water to a bottle, right? But right. not everybody that's creating a business that actually could be a good business maybe struggles with actually connecting it with a sustainability, you know, or a cause or something that could actually make the world a better place. What advice or thoughts do you have around that that you would give to people? Sure. So I so I I think about sustainability in sort of two different ways. So I think okay. 
classic sustainability, as you just mentioned, with like sustainability with a capital S, and that is saving the world, saving the planet, you know, reducing plastic waste, having an impact, thinking about global warming, you know, the, the very classic sustainability. And that's something that's very close to my heart. And I, I'm involved in um, a sustainable uh, fashion technology company, a sustainable packaging company, a company that's doing um, wellness and sustainability and, and rethinking um, supply chain. So that's sort of my classic sustainability with the capital S, but I'm right. also helping and advising and investing in companies that think about sustainability with a small S. And, okay. and the way that I define that is, is it's culture, it's morale, it's, you know, creating sustainable, um, uh, teams and environments and it, they don't have to be out saving the world, but at the same time, um, it, it is a different, as you mentioned earlier, it is a different day and time than when I started Swell 12 years ago. And thinking about like, how do you create a place that individuals want to be and work? How How is that work getting accomplished? How are you sourcing those people? How are you making sure those individuals feel valued at work and they're going to stay for the longer term? Like there, there's something very important about that level of sustainability and that creates more sustainable business yeah. Um, because of sort of the softer, smaller S internally. And I think that that potentially could be just as important. And I think just as meaningful for me to help these companies, because I can see that even, even sort of small conversations and small tweaks can have very big impact when it comes down to hiring and, and motivating key employees that, that will be with you. And because they're there, then it helps you achieve whatever the business model, you know, the service, the product, whatever it is the company is trying to do, even if it's not out saving the world. Well, yeah, I, I agree with you. And I don't mean this in the negative way it's going to come across, but I think okay. that might be the harder one to solve. On oh, a, I agree. It, I, yeah, I don't think that's negative. I think I think it is very hard to solve. And, and why I say that is because I think you're never going to be able to build a really good product that could potentially do some of maybe the like earth saving type stuff if you don't nail the sustainability with your employees. And I've noticed that a lot. I think like even five years ago, I think it was starting to happen, but I've really noticed that over the last maybe like COVID and post COVID or whatever we could argue whether we're still in it or not, but just let's just say post COVID um, the, like how tricky it is to keep good employees and make them happy. Like I've seen that just the turnover with some of the companies I've been working with is crazy sometimes and trying to figure Absolutely. that out. Absolutely. And I, I think it's, you're, you've really hit the nail on the head. I think it was maybe, you know, four or five, six years ago that we, we started to see a really big evolution of this. And it's one of the things that whether I'm formally working with the company on a board or informal, you know, as an advisor, I think this is one of the things that we, we spend the most time at. And I always bring it up. If it's not on the agenda, I say, let's, let's talk about it. But I think, I think the first thing that the companies can and should do is really think about what are those core values? Like what, again, if, if it's, capital S sustainability or small S, whatever it is that yeah. the company is trying to do or set out to do is, is defining what those core values are and say, what is it that we stand for? Right. And like, and it's, it, it's a sort of a trickle down from there. And then how, how do you design the company, the systems, the process around those, those big rocks, those core values of what the company stands for? And then how do you embed how do you embed those behaviors in the rewards and the system processes for the people, right? And so it's yeah. it sort of has to, it can't be just this thing that you do, you know, Zoom happy hours on Friday and everyone's great. No, it's it's employees are too smart and too important regardless of the company or the industry, right? But I, I think that it's it's really getting in there and sort of, I hate to say breaking things apart, but like really stopping what the yeah. company is doing. And, and I think in some companies, you really have to tie it back to the numbers. You have to tie it back to this is the product, this is the service, this is what we're trying to deliver. And we can't do it if we don't know what those core values are and we don't know what we're going to stand for and we know what we're going to say yes to or no to. And But it has to be infused into almost everything. And those are yeah. the conversations that I, I find are the most, they are the most difficult, as you said, but when you get them right, you have the biggest unlock. And those are the employees that are the happiest. They stay the longest. They come up with the most creative solutions. The culture is better. I mean, it's hard work, but it's worth it. 
I hundred percent agree with you, but yeah. where do you start with a company and, and can you maybe like, you don't have to name company names, but can you maybe give us some examples? Because we've all sat in those rooms where we go through the big rocks and the, all the things to yeah. corporate values. And then we talk about it once a year and then it's never, never talked about or heard from again. Right. So how do you actually go from that? Like, you know, team meeting for lack of a better term for it to actually living it where people can actually see it and that they're actually cared about and their opinions matter because that's the real struggle. I think it is the real struggle. I think it's just, I think it's starting with being really open um, and comfortable having candid and honest conversations with each other about sure. what's working, what isn't. And I'm I, I, oftentimes I see there's this real dichotomy between, I hate to say management and employees or yeah. HR and the rest of the team. But you mentioned like you, you have those big posters with the core values and the KPIs and you spend all the time and you wordsmith them and then you go to cocktails afterwards and then you never look at it again. Like yeah. if you ask anybody at the company, like what are those things that we stand for? They're like, let me run in the break room real quick because I know that there's like that pyramid on the wall. Yep. Um, but, but <laughs> sure. I, yeah. Yeah. You know, but I, I think, you know, we've all been in those yep, before yep. and I'm joking because I, we've had those posters as well. And I've also said, yeah. let me go get the poster. But, but I think it's having, having those conversations, but distilling it down and, and then being comfortable and honest. Like when you're in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, even if it's with your superior or with your, with your, you know, coworkers at your same level, you have to say, but wait a minute, this, we said that we, we believed in this as our core value, but the way that we're treating this um, issue, the way that we're servicing this client, the way that we're, we're working isn't in service or appreciation to how we said we're going to operate. But I think it's, it's, it's not waiting till the annual performance review at the end of the year. I think it's, it's being in the moment to be able to have that conversation. And, and I'm actually working with a company right now um, that's really struggling because they've never, they've never had candid conversations. They've never had performance reviews. They've never had, oh, and there's a fair amount of disconnect between the strategy of where the company is going and the work that the individuals that are doing and the performance that people think that they're doing versus what, but no one's talking about it. Right. And they yeah. are a sustainable company and they're making positive impact in the world, hmm. but nobody is happy there because nobody's willing. Everyone's sort of sitting there looking at each other, like who's going to address it first. And I, I, I think it's, it's sort of getting comfortable with the messiness of saying we, we don't have it all figured out. It's not going to be packaged, but let's just talk about like who we are, what do we believe in? How, where are we going? How do we how do we approach it together? And doing that on a really regular basis until you're you're not uncomfortable with having those chaotic moments. No, I, I think that's actually really good advice. The one thing I would say, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on, is I find a lot of because I I do a lot in like the startup space, sounds like you do yeah. too, where a lot of times the founder was a designer, developer maybe has a business background, maybe doesn't have a business background, but they don't do what you just outlined, like the annual reviews or salary, or, because they honestly just, maybe they've never had them themselves. They don't know how to do them. They don't really want to give even any sort of criticism. And then on the flip side of that, employees don't want to tell them, you know, their opinions either because they don't know how they're going to be taken. Right. And especially with kind of tech's been all doom and gloom lately with layoffs and whatnot. I think there's like this weird layer of tension sometimes where management's like, well, I've never done this before. I don't know how to do it. And then employees are kind of like, why aren't they doing these things that I've had maybe at like other jobs? And I feel like we're at this weird space because sometimes I get to see, I hear both sides and it's so like, what are your thoughts and how do you kind of bridge that gap with the companies you work with? You know, I think it's, it's, it is bridging the gap, but I think it's sort of meeting somewhere in between, right? It's not saying we're going to implement a big 360 process and it's going to be as corporate as wherever you might've worked before employee Y, but I also think it's doing something and getting started for those entrepreneurs that maybe had never done it before. They're not comfortable with it. Right. So it's sort of taking, taking a mini version of those processes that might work or sort of work in bigger, bigger firms and making them startup sized and getting started. And I think 
you know, I mentioned in the beginning that I, I didn't have an advisory board and I didn't have a board of directors and I didn't necessarily surround myself with individuals that had done it before. And yeah. I think that's one of the real challenging things for the, a, a fair number of the founders that, that I work with and I, I, I speak to on a regular basis is the, the individuals that they're talking to for advice aren't necessarily giving them the helpful tips of, of how to get out of where they are or how to take the, how to help accelerate their growth to get to the next level. So I'm not saying you need to go and put together a formal board or find advisors, but, but it is really helpful to kind of get up on the balcony and look down on your organization every so often, or at least get that fresh perspective of this is what is, isn't working, right? Like this is, this is what I need help with. You know, this, this is, um, you know, th this is what my employees would say, you know, in a candid conversation, how do I solve for it? Um, but I don't think you need to start with a giant, enormous process. Like sometimes it's just sitting around the table and having a conversation about things and, and then process, process your way from there. Okay. No, I think that's really good advice. How have you seen, or what have you done in the past to get your employees or the companies you work with, their employees comfortable to actually tell management maybe some of their ideas or what they could, some of the negative stuff, right? Because that can be challenging, especially if you're earlier in your career. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you could always do a informal, like walking around the office, but you're right, you're not always going to get get the candid comments. I mean, at Swell, we used to do a, you know, a Friday survey with three questions. Okay. Uh, I always laugh because one of the, one of the open comment text boxes was always, we need more champagne at happy hour. Um, <laughs> every time, I don't know, whoever that person was, God, God bless them. Um, you know, I would say those are true champagne problems, but, but those were sometimes really the, the serious things that somebody okay. you know, was struggling with that they didn't necessarily know how to bring up and they, they wanted to talk about. So um, it's really just encouraging people either, you know, talk to a friend, you know, talk to your friend at work, talk to HR, talk to your manager. But sometimes you really just need that, you know, that survey that goes out that gives people the conversation in an you know, anonymous way to say, like, here's what I'm thinking. Here's what nobody's asking me and what we need to talk about. Um, but then you asked something else I thought was great. And that question is, like, how do you get the great ideas? Um, and at Swell, we actually put our – um, our creative team and our design team um, right in the middle of the office in a very open office. And I know a lot of people work from home now, but sure. we made every single employee, whether they were, you know, an accountant or, you know, a bookkeeper, um, you know, somebody in, in HR walk by the design team and give their feedback. Yeah, and, that's good, smart. Yeah. And see the boards and see what's coming and touch and feel. And um, we we're based in New York, you know, we had uh, 110 people on the subway, going, you know, going to cool restaurants, going to museums. I mean, these were our thought leaders that happened to be our employees. And right. so I do think that like polling your employee base on a regular basis, not only lets them and, and encourages them to feel heard, but it, it, it allows your team to see themselves in the final product um, because, because someone took the time to ask. Yeah, no, yeah. that that's actually very good. The other thing that I would add to that that still sticks with me from probably like a job like 10, 15 years ago was I remember I went to my boss and I said, I can't even remember what it was, but I asked for something or if we could do something. And his response to me was like, I don't know. I got to like look into it. I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it ended up they didn't do it. But the thing that I found interesting about it is like, he was like, we can't do this, but he like, here's why. And I like... I could disagree, or, but at least they gave you like the why we can't do something. Because I find so many times management is just like, no. Nope. And you're like, well, yeah, but you're not even giving me like, like a reason, right? And I find just telling people, being honest with them, it's like, or we can't do that this quarter because of X, or we'll do that. And we're thinking about that for next year, whatever, right? Like give people a reason, I think is a huge, just to validate that like, you put some thought and effort into their opinion, even if you have to tell them no for whatever reason. That's right. I like that, Kevin. So I'm, I'm curious, what are you seeing in entrepreneurship right now? Because I've I was reading an article the other day that a lot of younger people aren't becoming entrepreneurs. What do you think the state of the entrepreneurship is right now? Because Investment seems like you always read, oh, nobody's investing right now, or this isn't happening, or that isn't happening. It seems all negative, but 
What are you actually seeing? I'm seeing a lot of really good positive signs right now. Yeah, I'm me too. Green shoots. I'm seeing green shoots. Oh, yes, the negatives are. It's really hard to get funding right now. But it's always been hard, isn't it? It's been hard. Like, I mean, I never got funding. I've yeah, it's really sure. Hard to get funding, but you know, it's 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 not only hard for this round, but I think that investors are really thinking about what is it going to take to bring this to scalability and profitability? Like how, how are you going to get this from here to where it needs to go for your next few rounds? Um, that being said, I think that for good entrepreneurs and good ideas and good companies, there's always going to be the funding that's needed. You're just going to have to work a little harder for it. Um, what, what I'm seeing right now is a fair amount of creativity. I would say business models are different. Uh, the go-to-market is changing. The retail landscape is completely upside down and different and very difficult right now. But I am seeing a fair amount of really interesting, um, creative business models um, that, you know, aren't tested yet, but some will make it. Some some will, some will break through. Um, I'm probably seeing more uh, tech-enabled and AI in plans than maybe you need to, you're probably seeing that too. Not everything needs an AI solution, but you should think about it. I mean, there probably should be one page in every deck that says, you know, here's, here's how we'll win with, with, with this in the future. Um, but I am seeing some green shoots. You know, I, I do think that there's some really good positive things coming out of, um, this, I guess, downturn in an economy. It all sort of depends on which numbers you're looking at and how you're deciphering the tea leaves right now. Sure. No, I think that's actually really good advice. I'm curious because you came up with an idea out in the world and and kind of solving your own need. What advice do you give to people to do the same thing and then actually go for it? Because there's so many times you sit with friends and they're like, you can tell they're like, oh, I wish this product exists. And then you just call them on it. You say like, why don't you do that? And they're just like, well, I can't for X, Y, and Z. But like, what made you actually go, you know what? I need this and I'm going to do it. Like, because that's a huge thing that I wish. And a lot of people look back later and say like, oh, I should have done that. So like, what advice do you give them to actually just go for it? Like you did. Yeah. You know, Kevin, I, the, the whole reason I did it is I was going to, I was going to kick myself when I saw somebody else do it. Sure. Um, and you know, I, I mentioned, I started out as a, as an accountant, but I think the most important thing that I did with Swell wasn't necessarily the design of the product, but it was building a brand. Sure. Uh, when you mentioned at the beginning, like I went into my my kitchen and I looked in the closet and there were five Swells. You couldn't say there were five, you know, beautifully designed water bottles in there, right? Like there, there needed, you needed to call yeah, interesting. something. You needed yeah, interesting. Yeah. This thing had to make it for me. It was you know having something that had very positive connotations, like swell, like the idea of the brand. The idea was like having a good positive impact on the planet and the people of the planet, and but it had to make you happy because you're so clever because you're keeping your favorite beverage hot and cold. And so, like for me, um, I think we were successful. I was successful because it wasn't the product; it was the brand. And so when I talk to individuals that have this idea, and I I get to see a lot of consumer products, like a lot of sure. here's my idea, here's this thing the universe needs. I always say, well, what are you going to call it? Like, what what is the brand? What is what are the core values of the brand? What does the brand stand for? Like, how do you spell it? Like, you know, like let, let's let's look at your mm, and and I it, some of that is the product, but a lot of it is how you feel because it, it unless you're inventing something completely new you're probably coming up with a derivative something that's there that you need to break through. And it is such a hard environment right now. It's so expensive to reach customers. Yeah. You, you need, you need people to be your street soldiers to go out there and use the product and tell the story for you. And to do so, it, it makes it a lot easier if you're building a brand in service to the product that you're creating. Um, so I would say that's probably the first piece of advice um, that I give to individuals that are that are thinking, and then I would say the second piece of advice I, I give to like all, like all the companies I work with is just to be really picky and cutthroat about getting the best partners that you possibly can, and sure. partners being everything from y- your accountants and lawyers as vendors to your you know first and middle employees that you hire you know, the manufacturers, the warehouse, the, because entrepreneurship is death by a thousand paper cuts. Yep. And, you know, the better, the, 
the better that you can be about having having better partners and, and those that have made mistakes on other people's dimes and that you're not having to do it yourself every time and it, switching costs are hard. I would say those are probably, you know, building a brand and, and having being lucky to have the better partners is probably the easier ways to to get started than not. Mel, I think that's actually really good advice. But you did something I think that's actually adds another layer of complexity and is you went for a high-end product mm -hmm. and that's tricky to do no matter what. But how did you make sure that your first few rounds of bottles that actually got shipped and were going out to people were of that high quality because that's hard to do even if you've been at it for a number of years, right? It's almost like you're trying to build like the iPhone of the smartphone game, right? Obviously that's challenging, right? That's so how did you do that? And what advice do you give for people to actually achieve that? You know, you can get a lot of things wrong in the back end that no one ever needs to know. Um, but if you're selling a product, it really has to be right from the beginning because you only have so many opportunities, maybe one opportunity to really wow someone and to get that person to get out, you know, to, to buy multiples and tell everybody, you know, go, go love this product. And so for me, it was very important to get the product right from the beginning. Um, it took a lot longer and it was a lot more expensive to bring to market than even I thought with my, you know, one, one or two page business plan that I came up with in the beginning. But for me, the, the product was essential to get right. And there are a lot of ugly babies um, along the way of prototypes, um, you know, that just didn't, that just didn't meet my personal expectations. And so I was really picky about, uh, you know, making sure the product looked great and worked really well from, from the beginning, because I didn't want to have to change it or tinker it, you know, after it came out. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. So yeah. did that delay the first kind of launch or shipments at the beginning because you were that much of a perfectionist? Yeah, absolutely. So I had done a bit of a friends and family um, uh, first round. Like everybody that I knew, I sent them an email and sent them the website. Of course, the website looked terrible, like a dog's breakfast because I wrote it myself. <laughs> you would be so embarrassed, Kevin, to see my first website because I wrote the copy. I took the pictures. Right. I, I, you know, I did it. I, you know, plug and play on myself. It had so embarrassing. But again, that was one of the things that I was like, okay, this doesn't have to be perfect. We can change this later on. Totally. But yep. I sent that first website to, you know, every, every kid I babysat when I was little, you know, every cousin I had, every friend I had from business school, whatever, and said, listen, I'm starting this, this company. And, you know, if you could support me and, you know, buy one or two, that'd be wonderful. And the product was, you know, I thought it was going to come out three months after that. I think it was almost a year later. I was still getting oh, wow. emails okay. from people saying, I sent you my $35 and it still hasn't come. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. It's, it's coming. It's going to be perfect. Um, but what, what happened then is I started getting orders from people I didn't know because I started getting a little tiny bit of press, like blogs and things like that. And there was a fair amount of pressure that I needed to get this product out so people didn't give up on, you know, what I was trying to execute on. So when things were, cause that, at that point you could have given up, what kept you going and push through kind of some of the darker times? I mean, I fear, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I didn't want to go back to being an accountant. Uh, okay. I, I really wanted to make it as an entrepreneur. Um, I also bought a fair amount of inventory. Um, okay. So there's there's something inelegant about a consumer product company is you actually have to buy the product. And sure. So when you have cases of these things, you know, sitting underneath your kitchen table, um, you got to put your backpack on and march into retail stores and ask if you can put them on the shelves, you know. And so for me, I just kept putting one foot in front of another, even during those darker days. Um, but some of it was just a pure escalation of commitment. Like I've already, I've already done this. I've already done that. I've committed to this. And next thing you know, you know, we've sold, you know, tens of millions of these things and they don't fit in my house anymore. Yeah. No, bad problem to have, right? <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious, what other advice do you give to people that are maybe on the fence about starting a company? Because I think more people should, but I feel like not enough people are right now. You know, 
I would say you don't always have to go all in. So I, totally. I quit my day job and and went all in because I I knew one thing about myself is I I just couldn't balance a few things. But I have okay. a fair number of good friends that have been incredibly successful entrepreneurs, and they did it on nights and weekends while they had day jobs. And so there's a way to dabble and to get proof of concept and to get something up and running to give yourself and your family and your network. Uh, confidence that you're onto something and there's a there there before, you know, you go into, um, you know, real, you know, debt or, you know, you, you, you give up your safety net. So I don't, I don't know that you always have to go all in and that there's ways that you can test, test before you make the leap. Um, I would say the other piece of advice is to, uh, to ask for help and to give up on the idea of um, perfection. I, it took me a number of years to not lead with how great everything was going, but to lead with what I needed. Um, when I ran into other friends or entrepreneurs and they'd always say, oh, how are things with Swell? Just I didn't even think about it. Just instantly, but just come out great, wonderful. Let me tell you all the wonderful things that are happening. And that wasn't, that wasn't helpful to me at all. And what was actually a huge turning point for me was in in admitting what I didn't know. And so yeah. now when I talk to some, you know, younger entrepreneurs, I'm an entrepreneur in residence and I talk to a number of people that are just starting out, I just tell them like don't don't lead with being overconfident. Lead, lead. everybody wants to give advice. You don't totally. have to take their advice, but yep. but ask people out to coffee or lunch or whatever and just say, "Can I have 15, 20, 30 minutes of your time because I'm really struggling with X and I think you know about Y." And yep. That really helps you build the skill set that you need and really plug the holes of, of where your boat might be leaking instead of just pretending everything is fine and then going out of business because you didn't have the expertise you needed at the time you needed it. No, I think that's actually really good advice. The other thing, it helps build your network. And on top of that, I find like, sure, you'll probably hear some no's or you probably won't, certain people won't get back to you. But I think majority of people, if you give them like a specific ask, they will try to help you. Majority of people, I would say. I think that's right. Yeah, it's interesting. But it's it's also mind-boggling to me how many people don't ask. And I, I get it. It's hard. It's easier to it's easier said than done, right? Especially now once you get over that hump. But I think to your I think that's actually really good advice. And I hope people actually do that more. So I'm curious, we're we're kind of coming to the end of the show, but what else are you seeing right now? Or is there any spaces that you think need innovation maybe or more sustainability that you think maybe people could try to maybe generate some ideas to build businesses in? Well, I always would encourage anyone to build sustainability into any business. <laughs> sure. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but I probably have a little bit of um, selection bias in what I get to see and, and what I'm looking for. So I'm, I'm lucky in that I get to see some really positive solutions. Um, I'm seeing a lot. Uh, I'm seeing a lot in sort of um, health and wellness, healthy eating, healthy food, um, a lot in, um, I guess, green, green packaging and single use packaging and um, sort of thinking like leapfrogging over, you know, just recycling disposables. Um, so I think that's a place that I'm, I'm encouraged from an innovation perspective. Um, I'm seeing, and I mentioned earlier, I'm just seeing a lot of really unique business models, um, which yeah. I think is keeping me younger. I think it's keeping me more fresh um, because as you mentioned, I started Swell a dozen, you know, 13 years ago. Um, it was an easier time. It was an easier time. Like I think it's a little harder right now to just say direct to consumer plus a couple key retailers and there you go. Um, I think I had it easy. I think I had it easy, but now um, you have to think about you know how how do you find your customer and how do you do it in a unique, authentic, um, inexpensive way. And you know I think that there's some there's some pretty cool companies out there trying to attack the market, and I'm enjoying supporting them and learning from them at the same time. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think it's I think it's easier nowadays to like build software and maybe even get a prototype built, but actually getting it into people's hands is the harder part, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So sadly, we're kind of coming to the end. So how about we close with mentioning where people can get more information about yourself and any other links you want to mention? Oh, sure. I'm glad Kendra's on the phone. Um, <laughs> I think... I think my website is Um, but it is. It, yep. It, it is. Okay, great. Yes. So I'll say it. Uh, so you can visit me at sarahkaus.com. 
Um, <laughs> sorry, Kendra, I really should know. I and know that there's a link. There's a link in my LinkedIn. Kendra had me put it there. And it's k a u s s dot com. Yes, s a r a h k a u s s dot com. Perfect. Thanks, Perfect. thanks, Kendra, giving me the thumbs up. See, I told you, Kevin, I get nervous. Like, you're going to ask me how to spell my name? I don't remember. Don't <laughs> no, it's all good. I No, it's all good. Um, okay, great. Very cool. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be on the show, and I look forward to keeping in touch with you and have a good rest of your day. Yeah, you're great, Kevin. Thank you for mm-hmm. being a, a customer, and thank you for asking such thoughtful questions. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thanks for listening. Please visit our website at buildingthefutureshow.com to join the free community, sign up for our newsletter, or to sponsor the show. The music is done by Electric Mantra. You can check him out at electricmantra.com and keep building the future.